Woo! <laughs> so I know I'm the person standing between you and the break, so um, I'm going to get started. And today, I want to talk to you about success. Because who doesn't want success, right? All of us do. And what I want to kind of start with is I want you to think about yourself right now. If you imagine yourself on a scale of 1 to 10, where 10 is this amazing, remarkable version of you, and you are wherever you're at today, maybe 6, maybe 7. Now think about what you need to be a 10. What is the experience that you want to get, or the projects or things that you need to work on to kind of help you be there, right, where, where you're successful? This is your greatness gap. It's the distance you know, between your current state and where you want to be. So now that you have those things in your mind, you guys have them in your mind, right? Right? Yes, nod. OK, everyone's asleep. <laughs> now I want you to imagine that you come to work tomorrow, and your boss is interviewing your replacement. And this person's going to take your place. And as you're sitting outside the room, and you're, you're kind of thinking about this and thinking about this happening, what is different about them than you? Why are they better at your job? Maybe they're going to work more hours. It's possible, but I'm guessing that that's probably not true because there's an actual kind of physical limit to how many hours each person can work per week. And if you're doing your work, that's probably not the case. So is it that they know more? Maybe they have more technical skills or they're more knowledgeable. It's possible. I mean, maybe that was what you identified when you were thinking about your, your gap, right? But Chances are you have legacy knowledge of your current systems and things like that, and you had the skills to do the job or you wouldn't have got it. So that's probably not it either. So what is different about them? Well, I don't know what you're thinking, but chances are it's things like the way they integrate with the team, how they work with others, the attitude that they bring to work, their ability to communicate, right? Because your success and your gap, right, is not just about what you do, but it's about how you do it. And so I question you as you think about that delta between what's standing in between you and where you want to be. Is it really the things that you thought of, or is it something else? Early in my career, I had this experience, and it kind of hit this point home for me specifically. Sorry, I think my earring is like hitting my mic. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> So, okay, better? All right. No, oh, all right, hold on. Hopefully, there we go. Still not really helping to the side. Okay. <laughs> Jewelry malfunction. All right, so I was telling you the story. When I was first starting my career, I was working on this project. And I was working on a team of six people. And when our project shipped, the VP got up on stage. And uh, we, this was back when you did shrink wrap software. So things took four years to ship. And I remember him getting up on stage. And he was talking about everyone's projects. And in this org of 400 people, he called out two projects. And one of them was my team. And so this was a big deal. And on that project, I had worked the hardest. I was the most junior member of the team, but I had worked nights and weekends, and I, my effort was like, you know, for my skill level and my experience, like I had contributed as much as almost the guy who designed the feature. And when the VP got up on stage, he said, I want to recognize Josh and his team. And I was like, Josh? Josh was like lower towards the bottom of the group, and he went to all the meetings. Like he didn't get a lot of coding done, and so I was just floored. I remember sitting there at this time where everyone was happy and I was, I was miserable. Because I expected that I would be recognized for the work that I did. I expected that the praise would be proportional to the effort. But that's not true. And I think when I tell this story, a lot of people it really resonates with because everyone wants to believe that there's this utopia where people are going to see you and recognize you for the merit of your work. But that's not reality. And so about two years ago, I was on the other side of the table for this. I took over a team, and I was told one of the employees was a poor performer, and that it was my job to handle it. And I said, well, let me figure this out. How do you measure performance? 
And I really wanted to be as objective as possible, right? I wanted to give the guy a fair shot. So I said, okay, what about how many hours you know, d does it take? And I realized that's a terrible metric, plus I wasn't even there, so I have no idea what he's putting in. So I didn't look, that didn't work. So one of the things people also talk about using is lines of code affected. But I think this is a terrible metric, because I remember once it took me three days to write one line of code, because it was a very awful bug. So I hate this metric. So other people suggest like quality or tests, like can you look at those things? And I think using that as a metric is also rife with problems. And so, you know, then I was like, well, features, right? Let's look at what he delivered and the time that he delivered it. That seems pretty objective. But that's actually wrong, too, because you know why? You don't have the context. You don't know, did he have to learn something to do it? How much time did it take? Did he cut and paste? Like, you don't actually know any of those questions. And of course, there's all these other things that come in to being a good developer or being a part of a technical team. And so I sat there, and I'm like, how do you judge performance? And I realized there's not really a way. That all I had to go on was what people thought of him. So think about that. How people are judging your performance isn't necessarily on what you're doing. It's what people think that you're doing. And the crazy part is, the better you are at your job, the less anyone knows what you're doing. Right? <laughs> and so this is, this is crazy. The more autonomy you have and the better you are, then, then people don't really know. And so this is just kind of like flummoxed me because I, I thought I could be a really good manager and really judge people the right way, and, and I couldn't. And then what's really interesting is I've been thinking a lot recently about these no-manager organizations. And, and I sort of love the idea because I think in tech, you hire these brilliant people, right, knowledge workers. And you want to give them authority. You want to let them work autonomously and just get things done. But in these organizations, I think the guys at GitHub yesterday said, um, it's actually not no managers, it's all managers. Everyone's a manager. And whether you like it or not, that's actually true even if you have a manager. Because if you go back to this whole idea that no one knows what you're doing, it's your job. At least if you do have a manager, though, you have someone who's supposed to be your advocate, who's supposed to know what you're doing. But without one, or if you don't have a very good one, you need to learn how to be your own. And this means that you all need to be a leader, every one of you. At least if you want to get credit for the work that you're doing, you want to be successful. And so that means you have to figure out how you are going to lead. And so what is leadership? So I originally had this idea that I was going to put this big like, definition that said, this is what leadership is. But I found as I Googled around, there were so many things. There was like, they're good communicators. They know how to set a vision. They know how to motivate people and support them and get things done. They can spark innovation. I was like, what is a leader? And so in my research, I did find this little story that I sort of loved that talks about the portrait of a leader. And, and I'm just going to kind of run through it because I think it's really telling. So at 22, he got his first job, but he lost it. So he decided he was going to run for the state legislature, but he lost. So he decided, OK, well, I'm going to start my own company. So he decided to start his company, but it ended up failing. And the debt from, oops, going backwards, sorry. There we go. The debt that he accrued ended up taking 17 years to repay. So he said, OK, well, I'm going to run again um, for Congress, or, or for the state legislature, but he lost. He's very persistent, right? So now he's 31 years old, and he says, well, I'm going to try to be an elector instead, because that's like a lesser position. But he didn't get that either. So he decided to run for Congress, but he lost. So he tried again, but he lost again. And on his third time, he actually did get elected, but then he didn't get reelected, right? It's like, you guys hear this? It's like failure after failure. <laughs> so he decided he was going to run for the Senate, and he lost. He tried to secure the VP nomination, but he didn't get it. He ran for the Senate again and didn't get it. But you know who this person is? Abraham Lincoln. But who, like, what is a better leader than Abraham Lincoln? And so it, it took him between his first job that he lost at 22 to when he was finally elected president at age 51. Do you ever feel like at any time in there he wasn't a leader? No, right? Of course he was a leader. And this is the interesting thing, because leadership is not a position that you hold. It's not something that someone gives to you. 
Leadership is about the decisions that you make, the actions that you take. And so even if you don't have formal authority, and even if you feel like you're fettered by a dozen limitations, if you really want to lead, you can. So that's what I'm going to talk about. But I, I think leadership is really about power. So I want you all to do a little exercise with me. I want you everyone to stand up. Stand up, everybody. And if someone is not standing up in your row, I want you all to look at them and give them a dirty look. <laughs> okay, now everyone sit down. Come on. Okay, so you know what that was? That's power. <laughs> I love it. Want to do it again? No, just kidding. Um, and that's the interesting thing, right? Because when people think about power, they usually think about abusing power, unhealthy uses of power. But the truth is that when you use power the right way, it's really just good leadership. And so this is kind of my favorite slide about all these different sources of power. Hopefully, it's kind of hard to read on here. But there's really formal power that's given to you by a position, and then there's informal power. And since I have no ability to grant any of you guys any formal power, I want to talk to you about informal power. And if you think about your own experiences, right, like the people that you've chosen to follow in your life, the people that you've looked up to, they might have held positions, but a lot of the time you look up to them because of who they are, and you would have followed them regardless of what position they held. And so this is something that means that you can build power in this way. So let's talk about each of these. So charisma power. So this is when someone does something because of that person's charisma, right? They, there's something about the, the person that they like, their machismo or whatever. And I think other than kind of showering and, and like dressing nice, maybe, there's charisma sort of limited. It's a fixed quantity for most people. But even if uh, I, I could tell you a lot about charisma, I'm probably not the best person because this is, in a way, I lead. Um, but Let's talk about expertise power, because this is something I think people in the audience should be really familiar with. When I think of a CTO, I think of an expert of, and, and people leading in this way. They lead because they are like the smartest person in the room. They have the most expertise, or they know the most about a system. And so senior engineers, senior leaders, CTOs, often I think this is their, how they lead. So you can go to lots of sessions today and build your expertise. So I'm not going to talk about that either. <laughs> what I want to talk about is relationship power. Because this is something that I bet every single one of you can actually get better at and do a better job. And you can continue to increase this source of power in your day-to-day -day work. So let's talk about, like, what is relationships? So relationships are about trust. If you have no trust, you have no relationship. If you have limited trust, you have a limited relationship. And if you have strong trust, well, then you have a good relationship, right? So you, if you think about the trust and you think about what you need to do, it means that you're going to act authentically and consistently and you're going to do what you say, right, basic level. And you probably already know this and you probably already think about this because I bet you care a lot what your boss thinks and your boss's boss and maybe their boss or, you know, and so forth. And you probably make an effort that when you talk to them or interact with them, you maybe treat them a little bit differently than your peers. No? Yes? Maybe? Yes. People are sleeping. <laughs> um, but the actual reality is that when you think about trust in an organization, it's a lot like a graph, right? So if you go back to my kind of original, one of my original examples where I was talking about that employee I had that was a poor performer. In this way, your trust and your relationships are like a network graph, right, with these weighted edges. And he didn't have trust from his peers, so it didn't matter how much I liked him and wanted him to be successful. He was going to struggle in that organization until he fixed his trust graph, right? And so this means that you need to think about your trust graph at work, how people see you and how people think of you. And so I have this little model that I made up that I like um, that kind of had the three elements of trust. And I adapted this from like this corporate success thing, but I, I think it's interesting. There's really three things, and I'm going to talk about each of these. So there's your contribution, there's your reputation, and there's your relationship architecture. So let's talk, I keep hitting the wrong button. Come on, slide. sorry, you guys get a replay. There we go. Contribution, that, that was an exciting slide. 
So your contribution is the one that's probably the most obvious, right? Like, you know that you need to work hard and you need to set an example and be good at your job, right? This, this is sort of like expertise power, but, it, but you need to be amazing. And another important part about this is, is how you do your job. So I have this big thing about you need to practice what you preach. Uh, when I took over this team once, it, it was, uh, they had launched this thing and it failed and uh, the manager kind of hired me to come help clean, it, clean up things. Um, and I remember being transferred in and the, the, the team, director of the team had made everyone come in on a Saturday. And I decided to come in even though I hadn't officially started because I wanted to get to know the people and, and kind of learn about what was going on. And I remember sitting in the, in the corner of the room because I didn't have a lot to add and just listening to them talk and say such horrible things about the director who was wine tasting. Well, he made everyone come in and work on a Saturday. And yeah, I know it's pretty horrible. And I remember just thinking to myself, like, I never wanted to be that person. And so, you know, I've always made a point of being on call, uh, in, in the on-call rotation, even if, you know, and I think, you know, Lou kind of talks about him coding, but I think not asking people to do things that you're not willing to do yourself. It doesn't matter what it is or what your role is. And I think thinking about what you do and how you do it uh, and always acting with integrity. So I have this mentor who I was talking to about this talk, and when we were discussing it, he said, well, I interview for integrity. And I'm like, what do you ask them? Like, do you steal office supplies? <laughs> and he said, no. I asked them about how their software performs in like two or three years from now, or, or you know, and, and what do they say? And he's like, good engineers who code with integrity, is how he put it, they'll be able to tell you that things work and they're scalable because they do the right thing even when no one is looking, even if they know no one is ever gonna see or revisit their code. And I thought that was just such an insightful thing to say and how to think about integrity in the context of engineering. So the other thing about this, I think, about your contributions, besides just you know, being a good person and all of that, is that you have to let people know what you do. Right, going back to some of the original points, you know, uh, Josh was recognized on our team of six because he was the one who went to meetings and gave status for our whole team. In, a lot of, in retrospect, he was the reason that the VP even knew about us and like what we were doing in a lot of ways. And you need to basically have an explicit contract with whoever is responsible for your work and judging your performance that says, if you give me autonomy, I'm gonna tell you how I'm spending my time. One of the greatest things I did as a CTO was to start emailing my status to a, the CEO, which he was like, this is not something executives normally do. But it was interesting because I think the higher up you are and the more responsibility you have when you're managing hundreds of people, uh, people don't actually know what you do all day, but it sure seems like you're really busy. And so I think being able to proactively communicate that can be really helpful um, to just give people that visibility. Just make sure that you do this in a clear way. I, I sometimes tell people this and they write like a book to their manager. No one wants to read that. So think about who you're sending the same, you know, the message to. You don't send the same message about like an outage to the board or to your executive team that you would to say your, your team doing the operations. You know, think about your audience and craft your message accordingly. I think another, you know, kind of important part in all this is making sure you're using the right language. I love this slide. Uh, because, if, for example, if you ask people what done means, like what it means to be finished with something, you'll almost always hear a different definition. And so getting good about how you communicate status and progress so that people understand what you're actually saying. Um, I think another really important part about uh, your contributions is understanding your timing. So I talk a lot about pet peeve about people being late. But I think um, learning to be on time is both showing respect to people, but it also, it, you know, you've got to deliver on your commitments. If you say you're going to get something done, when you say it, do it. And if you need a really good reason, I sort of love this, is that if you actually always do what you say or you show up at the place you're going to be when you say you'll be there, like that's predicting the future. Like think about that. It's kind of cool. <laughs> um, and before there was Agile, there was uh, this thing called Rational Rows, and maybe some of you aren't even old enough to know what that is. But <laughs> what they used to say was to always pick the, do the hardest things first. So get good at managing your time, 
Prioritize the things that you don't understand or that you don't know how to do first, and just get really good at always being the person who hits their deadlines and, and does what they say they're going to. So you guys get all that stuff, right? Like, you know how to be a good worker. Worker, it sounds kind of bad, but if contribution is what you do, your reputation is how people think about what you do or how they think about you. And you'd be amazed at how many people don't really understand or have visibility into this. And so one of the things I always tell people is that you've got to solicit feedback, and not just from your manager or, or your chain of command, but your peers, the people that you're working with on projects. And don't just ask them, hey, how did I do? Because that's actually a really hard question to answer. But if you ask, hey, can you look at this thing that I did and give me feedback on how I could have done it better? Like, that's a much easier thing for your peers and other people to help. And it's going to help you understand, you know, what you're good at and what you're not. The important thing um, with this is just to make sure that you're really open to the feedback. Because sometimes you're going to hear things that you don't like. But feedback is actually a very precious gift. And so learning to get really good and being respectful and kind of taking these comments to heart. So let's do another exercise where you can stay sitting. <laughs> um, I want you to think about your favorite coworker. I want you to think about this person and what you admire about them. Thinking about them? What do they do differently than everyone else? Like, why do they stand out to you? And when you go to them to talk to them about something or a problem, um, what is it, how do they make you feel? Do you have this person in your head? Do you kind of have those qualities? Does anyone say that about you? Because if they don't, then maybe you have some work to do because you want to be that person. You want to be the person that people want to work with. So I think a key part to all this is making other people feel important. So if you think about uh, when you were thinking about when you talk to this person, how they make you feel, they pay attention to you, they listen to you. I, I love this uh, saying that imagine that everybody you meet is wearing this big sign that says, I want to feel important. And then that, that's a great way just to go into every conversation and think about how you can do that. I think that at work, one of the things that corporate America doesn't get enough praise, like people don't hear enough that they've done a good job. And I think that people expect their managers or other people to do this, but the reality is that doesn't happen. But you can actually give praise. In fact, I tell everyone, you should set a reminder on your calendar that every week to send an email to someone or send an email to someone and CC their manager about how what they did impacted you in a positive way. It's just a great way to add more goodness to the world. I think another important thing, especially for engineers, is you've got to be open to new ideas. This is something that I struggled with. Like, I, I would have never thought this was a good idea. <laughs> Uh, when, I was, uh, when I was going through, when I was a senior engineer, I remember people used to tell me like, what they wanted to do, and I would tell them all the risks and problems and reasons why it wouldn't work. And, and I think we're trained to look for bottlenecks and like, flaws. But the thing is that that actually is like, what that does is it doesn't, people don't feel like you're helping them. They feel like they just don't want to tell you ideas anymore. And that's really bad in a leadership role. And so if someone comes up with an idea, like learn to um, take an interest in what they're saying. And one of the techniques I had an executive coach tell me was just to pause. Um, and instead of just reacting and being like, oh, that won't work, to like think about why and really like count in my head for three seconds, which actually sounds like a long time, but it's not very long, and before you reply. And that way you can then uh, you know, give them an answer that makes sense. So I think the other thing is that you don't want to commiserate. A lot of the time, you know, misery loves company, and it's easy to kind of fall into this pity party. But you've got to make sure that you don't do this, because if you just change your mind about a decision, or you get on board later um, with additional information or whatever, then people aren't going to trust you. Um, a great technique to do this is just learning how to reframe and helping other people see both sides. You can ask questions about, you know, how do you feel if you were the other person, or how would you feel about this situation a year from now? Um, so let's talk about the third part, because this is actually, I think, is one of the more interesting parts. Um, so your relationship architecture. So this is like your little trust graph. So let's do another exercise. I love these exercises. It makes you guys like have to think. <laughs> um, if you think about, I want you to make a two-ordered list. 
So the first list, I want it to be the most important people at your work. So the people that are known for getting things done, the people that other people feel are important, the people in successful roles. So if you have those people in your head, now I want you to make a second list. But this list, I want to be like the people that you hang out with, the people that you're closest to. Are they the same group of people? Because if they're not, then I would say that you can be a little bit more deliberate about your relationship architecture. And there are opportunities where you can you know, kind of build some new relationships and kind of have a stronger trust graph. Because you're going to be judged by who you hang out with. Like the, Jim Rohn has that saying that you're the average of your five closest friends. And I think it's true. And I think it's especially true at work. It's like guilty by association. And so if some of these really important people um, you, haven't, you don't have a best relationship with. You've got to repair those, uh, you've got to repair those bridges. And you know, this is just a, a slide to tell you that the, the shortcut way to kind of do this is identifying those important people and starting with them. If you're new, this is a great way to start. You've got to identify the informal leaders and the formal leaders and kind of figure out how you can align with those people. So, Let's talk a little bit about how to do this, and I'll give you some quick tips, and I'll try to get through this pretty quick, because I know we are running behind schedule. So I love this analogy that relationships are like film strips. So if you have negative interactions with someone, um, that's OK, because you can fix it by creating more positive interactions. Because if you think about every time you interact with someone, you're generating a, a little frame, right? And the more interactions you have, the more you feel like you know someone. The more authentic your relationship is, the more trust that you might have. This, um, this is also the same reason, oh, dang, I keep doing that. This is also the same reason why um, unfair promotions happen. So have you ever, uh, a great always is also thinking about it is uh, new hires. So if you have two people that you interview, and, and like one person does slightly better in the interview, but the other person's referral that other people worked with, who are you going to hire? You're going to hire the referral, right? Because you just, there's more of that film strip to go on. And that's the right thing to do with the information that you have. But that also goes like when someone gets promoted because they've been there longer, but maybe they're not as good as the new guy. It can be because of these film strips. But that means that that's actually a good thing, because if you know that, then you can generate more of your film strips, right? So these important people, you've got to figure out how to generate some positive interactions with all of them. So if you have some negative energy, you know, go and apologize. Take care of it. You know, be the bigger person. If you have a lot of uh, jerks on your team, <laughs> I, I talk about like jerk handling. There's, I kind of have a three-step formula which is people act that way because there's a reason, like there's some fear or insecurity, or maybe they just want to feel important. And so these are things that you can give them. You can remove the fears, you can make them feel important, and you can make them less, like, you know, more secure. So how do you do it? You be present. This means you don't multitask. This means you actually listen to what they're saying, right? And this can be hard, especially in meetings or other places. So if they're talking a lot, one of the great ways is to write what they say up on a whiteboard. So it makes them feel heard, right, because you've acknowledged it. Another thing is if you, these people are like the strong, silent types, where they, they kind of take a long time to process, if you ask them a question, actually wait for their answer. Like, this is a, a, an important technique to learn how to do. And make sure that you actually hear what they're saying. So this is where the whiteboard thing can come in handy, but, you know, you just got to listen and verify that what you've actually heard is, is what they mean. Three more slides. Um, so, you know, what you need to do is really make an effort to build great relationships with everybody. Everyone you meet with, like think about your trust graph, right? So stay calm, focus on your goal, and really try to improve all of your relationships. And if you do this, it may be hard, but I promise you that it's gonna create more opportunities, right? So as you think about what you need to work on with your different elements of trust, right? Think about what you need to do. Does your contribution need to show more? Do people need to see more of your contribution and your reputation? Or do you just need to build better relationships? Because if you do this, then you're going to be really powerful. I love this slide. It's my favorite slide. So I'll leave you with one final thought, and then you guys can go to break, because I know everyone's antsy. Um, 
is that if you think about success, right, the original question of where success comes from, think about promotions and raises and job opportunities. Those aren't given to you because of your work or what you do. Those are given to you by people. And so success comes from people. So think about how you can leverage that and get more of it in your own life. Thank you.